first, just to look at CIC a little bit in, in, in as they say here, at a glance. Um, uh, one thing to keep in mind when you, we talk about migration, um, uh, there is a kind of an essential tension, you know, traditional historical tension. It's always, it has always been there, and it's still with us. Uh, it's, a, it's not a, a kind of earth-shaking tension, but it's, it's important to realize it. Uh, CIC, in, it, in terms of its mandate, tries to facilitate uh, uh, the flow of um, uh, uh, immigrants to Canada, but at the same time, it needs to control that flow. So it's not a facilitation in the sense of going out and promoting and doors are open, anybody wants to come, come in. It's not that type of facilitation. It's a kind of a balanced one where the facilitation role is balanced with the uh, control, the screening, right? So you're screening for, you don't want the criminals or really bad guys or people with uh, disease or, or certain type of conditions that would put uh, Canadian health and, uh, and security at risk. So those are important considerations because they come into the equation at any type of uh, decision-making level. Uh, or policy development level. So this is something uh, to really keep in mind. Uh, CIC, in terms of its overall mandate, uh, very recently, uh, not that it matters that much, but it's important for you to know, has also received the passport services, which used to be with uh, Foreign Affairs, now it's with CIC. Also, again, very recently from uh, Foreign Affairs, we also have taken over the program, uh, this morning we talked about it this afternoon, the International Exchange Canada, the IEC program, that also came to uh, uh, CIC, just to keep in mind. But having those, now we have a, 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 a spectrum of programs ranging from uh, making immigration decisions to integration refugee settlement. We will look at those a uh, little more in detail in a, in a few minutes. And overall, it's a very large department. It's not the largest in the Federal Public Service, but about 5,000 employees. That's a big big organization. Even if you look at some international organizations, uh, not many of them are, 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 are at that scale. Uh, and also another maybe the thing to keep in mind is that within CIC, and sometimes even in my presentation, I might stop, start talking about policy, operations, and that kind of stuff. Just keep in mind that the organization itself uh, uh, two core sectors. Uh, one is policy, where well, basically uh, my colleagues, uh, together with research and evaluation, develop policy, uh, meaning design programs. And then there's an operations sector, which is much larger. That's where the programs get implemented. Uh, by that, it could include settlement programming, it could include multiculturalism programming, or it could include basically processing of visas, visas for immigrants or um, uh, temporary residents. So when you look at, in a sense, when, if you were to ask the question, well, what does the CIC do? Uh, at a high level, as I mentioned, uh, CIC screens and approves admissions. Uh, either as a permanent resident applications or temporary resident applications. Temporary resident applications can include people who come here as tourists and also can include people who come here uh, with a uh, wanting to have a work permit uh, to work under the temporary foreign worker. Uh, but keep in mind those two separations because it will become clear to you in a few minutes as we discuss different programs, temporary and permanent. And in terms of type of work, CIC does uh, obviously, many of you know, I know, um, uh, especially from the uh, settlement community, there is a huge settlement work that CIC facilitates through funding uh, 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 in terms of uh, helping the settlement of the uh, newcomers. There's a resettlement, which is kind of a play on the words, but basically it, it deals with the refugees uh, uh, coming to Canada, uh, uh, government assisted refugees, and uh, facilitates their settlement. Uh, the word resettlement basically refers them as coming here to be resettled in Canada as their new, new home if you will. And also we, um, uh, uh, as I mentioned, we do manage access uh, by screening for security and health. And another thing not to, not to forget and not to mix uh, in terms of CIC's mandate, there is a settlement factor, but we also talk oftentimes about integration. And that's where this morning there was a question. Uh, integration meaning long term. It's not the settlement, finding the house, finding the job, but becoming Canadian. Uh, it, it's, that's when you start talking about integration, long term integration, second generation, the well being and the success of second generation, and of course citizenship. So CIC also, in terms of its mandate, you will see in a, in a few minutes. In fact, this is the best picture I can show you. Very hard to read, but don't worry about it. I will, I will try to give you a kind of high level description of it. Uh, later on, when I have a kind of a version of this deck that can be distributed, uh, you will have most of this material. Obviously, I don't see any, no, don't need, no need to take uh, notes. Uh, I will, I promise, I will get you a, a version that can be uh, distributed. What this uh, picture is referring to is actually, um, this is what we call in the government lingo, uh, program alignment architecture, PAA. 
all federal departments have this, not the same one, but the same concept. It's basically the entire uh, uh, spectrum of programs uh, that a department runs. Uh, and basically, uh, together with that, also the top four categories, SO1, 2, 3, 4, SO refers to strategic outcome. So basically, if you say CIC, CIC spends about $1.5 billion a year. That's a pretty good uh, amount of money. Uh, about uh, half a million of, uh, sorry, uh, 500 million dollars of it is to manage its basically operations, and the other one billion goes into the settlement programming. Uh, some to Quebec, and uh, about 700 million dollars of it goes towards the outside of Quebec settlement programming. Uh, so when you look at those strategic outcomes, really, if you if you were to be able, or those who can read it, uh, can explain to the other ones in the back. Uh, basically, the, no, I'm just kidding. But the, the, the first one is, is very important. It's the migration of permanent and temporary residents that strengthen Canada's economy. That's the strategic outcome one, which basically means that it's all the stuff that we're going to talk about today, the immigration programming, especially economic immigration, they are all under that strategic outcome one. Basically, all those programs, you can't read obviously names here, but from federal skill program to Canadian experience class to business immigrants, all those little programs, the boxes, they actually uh, ought to, if they function well, contribute towards that strategic outcome. Meaning that if they were to function and deliver the results that they are meant to deliver, they should be uh, creating a migration of permanent and temporary residents strengthening Canada's economy. That's the purpose as they, as they get delivered those programs. And every single program later on, I'll give you a sense of it, we, uh, and I was mentioning this afternoon, uh, we have an obligation to evaluate every single box that you see on this, uh, on this table uh, within a five year time period. Uh, by policy, uh, we evaluate all of them one way or another. Either we bundle them together or, 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 or we do an evaluation uh, research and, and then publish that. Second uh, uh, strategic outcome, very important to keep in mind, is the one uh, I'll read it for you, but family and humanitarian migration that re reunites families, so family reunification, very important part of the mandate, and also at the same time offers protection to the displaced and persecuted. So this is the refugee programming and family reunification. So uh, sponsoring family members uh, who uh, would be brought here by uh, immigrants or by Canadian citizens, uh, they would fall under that second strategic outcome, a very important component. As you can see, I mean, CIC is not just economic immigration. The third one, strategic outcome three, uh, is uh, this again this afternoon we mentioned this newcomers and citizens participate in fostering an integ integrated society. So the concept here is, and most of the programs that you are familiar with, multiculturalism, settlement program, citizenship, they fall under this strategic outcome. So all together bundled, if they are done, if they are delivered well, and if they support each other, they should be leading towards. Now you might say, what is the concept integrated society? What does it mean? We can discuss that you know, for hours and hours, but they should be contributing towards a Canada, Canadian society that's integrated, uh, that is at peace, that is multicultural, that respects diversity, and within which uh, uh, those participants, the newcomers especially, uh, have a fair uh, share in terms of their uh, economic or social or uh, uh, cultural uh, integration. So that is the area where CIC uh, uh, invests most of its uh, uh, direct uh, uh, expenses. The last one is about uh, basically the uh, uh, management of international migration and the health and admissibility type of issues, and that's the strategic outcome for. Why I go at this length, it is important to understand the complexity of the department, the mandate, and within which, uh, in a few minutes, when we start looking at kind of a digging down and uh, looking at the economic uh, uh, immigration programs, uh, you will have a, uh, a better understanding of situating what we talk about in the overall mandate. So when you look at the, uh, uh, again, as I said, on the left and uh, on the left column, if you can, I'm hoping that you can read from the back, or is it too small? Uh, I hope, okay. Uh, so one element is the temporary residence, as I as I discussed. Uh, it is very important to keep in mind what is the big difference, if you might say, between temporary residence and permanent residence. Uh, temporary residence. As you can see, which includes visitors and, of course, international students, of which we have some among ourselves, among us here, uh, uh, temporary foreign workers. These are programs that are driven uh, by demand. So CIC or Government of Canada doesn't go out every year and say, we're going to bring in this many number of tourists this year. No, of course, there are targets for the industry, but there is no uh, policy setting uh, targets for those, uh, uh, for those programs. As opposed to permanent residents, uh, which basically uh, they have uh, reset levels. 
today one of our colleagues was asking that question, how do we set levels? Uh, levels are set, in a sense, those programs, PR, are managed. How we set it, this is a different question, different discussion, but it's something to, very important to keep in mind uh, when you uh, compare those two, uh, uh, those two streams or those two programs. On the right-hand side, uh, nothing really earth-shaking, but that uh, 12 should be actually 1.2, I believe. Uh, it's not that, uh, <laughs> that's why I'm not circulating the deck. Uh, uh, this is kind of how the big categories of permanent resident uh, immigration uh, uh, are distributed currently. In 2012 and 2013 is not very, very uh, much different either. As you can see, the economic uh, uh, portion is, is, is the largest. And then we have the family class, refugees, and other refer to some smaller programs. Uh, but when you look at the PR uh, program, and in a few minutes we're going to look at the economic immigrants uh, closer, uh, but when you look at the um, uh, PR, uh, permanent residents, uh, always there's a humanitarian refugee group, family group, and the economic group. And when you look at these groups, also another thing to keep in mind, when you, especially when you start either seeing uh, stats here or stats on your own and you're looking at CIC stats, always keep in mind the following, please, is that when somebody says, oh, there was this many uh, uh, economic immigrants, they, it always, those numbers, unless it is stated otherwise, they always include the principal applicant and the family members. So if, if, if CIC, uh, if you see a statistic saying there were 10,000 of such, if it doesn't state that that's only principal applicants, because it is important to keep in mind because when you talk about economic and uh, labor market impact, uh, the levels that CIC sets, we, we never know. Of course, we can guess. But when you say uh, there is such a level of uh, uh, foreign sk uh, federal skilled workers that we want to bring in, that's always a number that includes the whole family. It's not the entire number that comes and starts working in the, uh, uh, taking part in the, uh, uh, in the labor market. Uh, no questions so far, so I'm hoping it's making sense at least uh, a little bit. Um, now, in terms of economic immigration being a key priority, probably not much need here to spend too much time on it, but it is, it is important um, uh, to, to, to underline, uh, especially in the last, say, uh, five, six years, uh, more and more emphasis has been put on uh, uh, immigration migration, but immigration policies uh, playing a greater role in economic development. So uh, as you can see here, there are speeches from Davos to other places. This is always in the newspapers and whatnot. And trying to look at how can immigration play a more active and direct role in the development of Canadian economy overall. Uh, this ranges from all the way finding the right immigrants, right skills, uh, at the right time and making sure they are here in Canada and contributing to the eco economy, but at the same time bringing the right businessmen, right entrepreneurs so they can come in and they can generate uh, more economic activity. So it's the full spectrum, including the temporary residents, right? Temporary foreign workers. So it's something to keep in mind as we discuss and also look at closer uh, in terms of uh, economic, uh, uh, economic uh, uh, immigration. So here, again, uh, really biggest kind of a takeaway from this little slide, and we're going to look at most of those programs in a second, except the uh, Quebec um, uh, selected skill workers. The reminder that uh, uh, when you look at the immigration overall, because it's a joint jurisdiction, right, with provinces and federal, uh, you can also cut and slice the uh, immigration economic programs by uh, national versus provincial. It is important because uh, it's a different way of approaching uh, uh, the immigration decisions or policies. So when you look at it in terms of the provincial territorial outside of Quebec, one of the key programs that has been on the increase for the last four or five years, those who follow the statistics will know, uh, it's the provincial nominee program where the provinces, and we will talk in a few minutes about that, where the provinces, uh, I would call, have the lead. Uh, in terms of uh, determining who should be coming uh, to Canada. And then, of course, CIC works with them. And uh, at the end, you have a very successful PMP program. I know successful. It was evaluated two, three years ago. And uh, the results were looking good. And now, in fact, they are looking even better uh, now. And then the national programs, obviously. But we're going we're gonna to come back to that. So when you look at uh, right now, what you're seeing here on this chart is a, even a closer look at the economic uh, uh, immigration. A little while ago, uh, that was the full 
package. Now we're looking at the economic immigration and trying to kind of see how that um, uh, spreads. Uh, of course, in a different world, probably a better world, if I had nice data uh, display kind of skills, you could see a graph changing over time. You know, you can see colors changing and stuff. I don't have those things. So you have to be kind of satisfied with this. This is a 2012 snapshot, right? So if you looked at four or five years ago, the orange would have been much smaller. Uh, obviously, it is where it is now. And it might be increasing uh, even further as we go uh, forward. Uh, the CEC, the, the red one, right here, right? If you can see my the, the cursor, uh, it was non-existent about four or five years ago for 2009. There was none there. And it has been growing since then, right? So I'm just giving you those hints just to kind of give you an idea that none of these kind of uh, proportions, if you will, or uh, ratios, uh, they're never static. They, they change, and they change as a result of policy decisions. And as I say, uh, the more uh, Canada uh, CIC uh, puts uh, the emphasis um, uh, on economic immigration or making the immigration to be more effective in terms of as an effective instrument towards economic development, then you start seeing policy decisions uh, uh, having impact on how, the, uh, how these programs uh, uh, behave in terms of uh, the space that they, they occupy. So let's, let's uh, start looking at the, some of the programs uh, a little closer. So the first one that I, I'll, I'll invite you here um, uh, to take a look at with me is the uh, temporary foreign workers. Uh, has been in the newspapers uh, this morning. We discussed this afternoon um, uh, uh, for a while. A few things to keep in mind to understand uh, uh, TFW, uh, Temporary Foreign Workers Program, really well. One, as I was saying, it's designed to be responsive uh, to uh, uh, labor skill shortages. By its design, basically, uh, it works in such a way that uh, uh, a portion of it is driven by uh, employers who cannot find uh, the labor, the skills that they are looking for. Therefore, they turn around and they go to HRSTC, now it's called ESTC, and they apply for a labor market opinion, saying that we haven't found these skills and these, uh, this type of labor, this quantity, this quality. And if they receive a labor market opinion after from HRSTC, ESTC, then they are allowed to go and find that skill, that labor overseas for a temporary period, not for immigration, permanent immigration purposes, and they would bring. And then there is also what we call non-LMO portion of uh, the TFW program. And that relates to a number of different agreements uh, that are set, uh, meaning a NAFTA or uh, international agreements. Um, uh, the, the one that I was uh, just mentioning a few minutes ago, International Exchange Canada. It's a, it's a program, but it's actually uh, driven by international agreements that Canada has signed with uh, different governments. So Canada would sign an agreement with France. We'll say, you know, uh, French, um, I forgot the exactly the age group, but up to, up to 25, I think uh, 30 years old, youth can come and work in Canada. We'll give them work permits. Uh, and Canada, uh, France will do the same. So Canadian youth uh, at, in, in that age bracket can also go and take a work permit and work in France. Those type of agreements will also generate temporary foreign workers. Why? Because under those agreements, you don't need a labor market opinion because there's nobody really to ask you a labor market opinion. Under those agreements, uh, CIC issues temporary, folk, temporary work permits to those individuals who come under those programs. So in your mind, when you think of TFW, you think of this LMO and non-LMO. And non-LMO portion is about uh, two thirds of the program. And LMO is the remainder, uh, one third of the uh, total. You, you are seeing some statistics here. I'm not going to, to numbers, uh, uh, not, to, not to bore you. Um, to keep in mind, again, making sure that um, uh, it's the labor market needs that are driving the uh, program, uh, the demand. It's a demand-driven program. And uh, another point to keep in mind is that this is one of the programs, and the next one we're going to look at, International Student Program, uh, are two temporary programs that uh, are feeders at a growing rate towards the permanent resident program. Meaning that, uh, as I give you the examples and some numbers in a few minutes, you will see that these two uh, streams, if you will, uh, they, they don't, they're not entirely parallel. Uh, there are bridges between them. And uh, uh, in a, a temporary residence, the temporary work permit holders under the temporary foreign workers uh, program, uh, all international students 
uh, do become permanent residents. And in fact, they are encouraged due to policy and program design, which I will give you a, 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 an, an example in a few minutes. So when we look at the international student programs, what do we see? This is one of the programs that many of you will be more kind of a naturally connected to. You must have a friend or a colleague or somebody uh, who, are, who are here as international students. As you know, international students, especially in the last five, six years, uh, it has become more and more um, easy. Uh, it, it has become easier for them uh, to, first of all, get work permits while they are studying. And especially at the end of their graduation, now they uh, uh, qualify for um, uh, work permits. Uh, uh, and that's their kind of a TR world, if you will, as, the, as, as, they are, as they are TRs. But at the same time, they're also encouraged uh, under the, if they have a uh, desire to become permanent residents, then they use that status. Uh, to uh, uh, apply under, in a few minutes we're going to look at it at the next slide, under the Canadian Experience Clause to become uh, permanent residents. Uh, uh, when we look at, uh, again, uh, uh, in the uh, Canadian Experience Clause, uh, you, you will notice th those are the linkages between the international student and the um, uh, TFW that allows those two uh, streams to feed each other, if you will, especially the TR feeding the PR, of course. Uh, a very close look at Canadian experience class, and now, if you have realized, we have moved now into the PR domain, from the TR domain, if you will. Canadian experience class, maybe I'm going to take just two minutes here and do a little bit of a kind of advertisement for my function. Uh, you might say, why all these changes? I mean, where are these um, uh, policy programs? Who comes up with the CEC program? Like, why wasn't there, you know, say, eight years or five years ago, and why is it there now, right? So part of the story, at least one that I believe in, is that as we do the research and look at evidence, and one of the type of research that we constantly do and measurements that we take is what are the determining factors? What is making a, what are the kind of metrics of success and what creates success? Now, that depends, of course, how you define success, but one of the uh, definitions of success, only one, I, I, I grant it, is uh, uh, economic integration, integration in the labor market. Uh, are the people uh, uh, earning uh, an income, uh, the newcomers, uh, at a level commensurate with their experience and uh, degrees and whatnot, and uh, what type of people are, are able to do that? So one of the determining factors we have been finding is always the Canadian experience. I mean, some experience in Canadian uh, market, uh, labor market, and uh, in addition to that also, of course, uh, uh, that touches a little bit in an indirect way, uh, credential recognition, and hence uh, a, a degree from a Canadian uh, uh, post-secondary institution uh, opens a lot of doors, and as we look at uh, retroactively, so we brought all that intelligence into the design of programs, and that's how CEC uh, was born in terms of um, uh, its, its origins. So basically what it does is that uh, uh, it, it puts a couple of um, uh, requirements uh, in terms of language skills, but it brings in the both uh, streams from students and TFWs, international students and TFWs, and gives them a chance uh, actually after one year of uh, work uh, in Canada uh, uh, at a level uh, that is, uh, again, um, uh, appropriate to their uh, uh, background in education. Uh, uh, and the language requirements being attached to that, for students this is not an issue usually because the students haven't gone through the educational system, they have the mastery of one of the official languages. And for the workers, again, there is a uh, CRB uh, for the temporary foreign worker uh, domain uh, on the NAC B uh, level. Uh, there is a requirement of CRB, Canadian language benchmark. This is a kind of a measurement uh, type. If, you might, if you're asking yourself what the CRB 5, what is it equivalent to, uh, it will be probably grade 6, grade 5. Uh, roughly, because these things are not one-to-one -one mapped uh, at all, and CLB 7 that you are seeing for MAC O and A, like administration and high-level management uh, kind of jobs, that's about uh, level, uh, grade level 11, 10, 11, uh, if you will. The, the English. English. No, English. English so CLB is the English <laughs> requirement. Sorry. You, you thought the level is too low? I, I well, CLB <laughs> goes only to level 8. <laughs> no, 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 there's nothing, there's nothing wrong. But maybe this is an opportunity, maybe you should, you should make your point so we can... Uh, please finish. No? <laughs> okay, all right. Okay, so 
basic the bottom line is there are, there's a language requirement uh, built into the uh, process and uh, Canadian experience, work experience built into the process. It used to be two years for students to be able to be eligible for CC. Now that's reduced to one year. So one year and a language that qualifies you to apply uh, for under CC. And as you can see in the numbers below here, uh, uh, so far, I think it's definitely way over the 20,000 uh, uh, individuals. And I don't have the numbers to show and kind of demonstrate to you here, but maybe who knows, next year or two years from now. We have already the initial first year results. By first year, I mean first year income results in terms of our research. And both of these groups coming from worker or student uh, background, they are doing way above uh, Canadian average. And they are doing way above, obviously, by that definition, also uh, average uh, uh, newcomer immigrant uh, performance. So these are good signs. But again, uh, I keep kind of uh, putting caveats to what I'm saying, but it's important. These are only just economic measures, right? I, I'm not speaking about social, cultural, other types of integration. But at least on the economic measure, they are doing really well. And there are no reasons why they're not doing well in other domains either, especially on the workers' case, many of them uh, temporary foreign workers uh, spend many years in Canada before they make their application. And in that, we know that they are also establishing um, uh, uh, community relations, uh, community uh, 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 links uh, and whatnot. So the next one that we will look at, again, it's a kind of in a backdoor way, the same story. Uh, first of all, the program is the PMP, the Provincial Nominee Program. Uh, again, some of you might be uh, familiar with this. The reason I said it's a kind of a similar story because this is also another program uh, uh, as I mentioned, this is the kind of a provincial PT-led uh, program, if you will, um, that uh, is benefiting uh, from the, uh, as you, if you can look at the bottom numbers, if you can see them, but uh, uh, that is benefiting from the temporary residence stream. So if you look at the all PMPs total average, basically about half of them, provincial nominees, had been temporary residents. Uh, most of them, I don't know really this for a fact, but most of them in the same province. So provinces basically, just to give you a very quick one on one PMP, PMP is different than any other um, uh, CIC program in the fact that the province identifies the individual. So province identifies the individual and nominates the individual as a first step, which as a step doesn't exist in overall, except in Quebec programs. Uh, and then that person identified by the province is processed by CIC, still screened for the same um, uh, admissibility and health and whatnot, and then arrives as a PMP permanent residence. Sometimes they arrives to Canada, sometimes they're already in Canada. As you can see, overall, almost half of them are already in Canada, uh, or they have been here, and they become PM, uh, per, uh, permanent residents as, as uh, in some provinces like British Columbia, almost 100% of them have been TRs. So this is the uh, contribution of the temporary resident stream, if you will, either as um, uh, students or workers, temporary foreign workers, to the uh, development of the uh, uh, permanent resident uh, stream. Around the uh, provincial nominees, uh, to keep in mind, again, um, uh, of course, no program is, is static. I mean, they're all dynamic and they change over time. One thing to keep in mind around the PMP is that um, uh, up until the PMP evaluation two, three years ago. Uh, the PMP program, if you went out and you looked at each province's PMP, you would find very different programs. Programs, the Manitoba would have 15 different streams ranging from family relations, uh, students, they would have, like provinces would have their own student streams to turn a student going to a Manitoba uh, uh, higher education uh, to turn them into PR because provinces, the main logic behind the PMP from the very beginning had been the distribution of immigrants. You might have heard the term MTV, not the one you know about that MTV, but the, the MTV, it was a you know Montreal, Toronto, Vancouver phenomena where most of the immigrants were going and settling in. And the desire was, at least starting from 2006, five on, uh, trying to do something to um, uh, really move the immigrants uh, uh, to other centers, if you will. So PMP had made that promise from the very beginning uh, uh, that it would facilitate uh, the distribution of uh, immigrants across Canada. And it has done that, and it is doing that. Meaning, if a, uh, when you look at, it's not here at the statistics, but when you look at the rates of immigrants becoming a PMP, 
PR in a particular province, let's say. I know Ontario program is very small for now, but uh, it, it will, we will see where it, where, where it goes. But if, if they become uh, PM, true PMP in Manitoba, most of them stay in Manitoba. Uh, there is some movement out of Atlantic, we, we see that. But when you look to you do the mobility analysis, uh, PMP, in a sense, is almost like a glue. You know, once you receive the um, uh, PR in that province, they are able to connect and whatnot. The other thing that I want to leave you with as, as we move forward is the uh, uh, PMP, uh, as I said, there are variations of programs. There. Now, it's kind of slightly, uh, since the evaluation, uh, as you can see, I'm trying to get a credit out of what I do, so it's, it's informing policy. But it, it is. Uh, since the evaluation, basically, as we found out that there are too many streams and not standardized, and especially, especially we underline the fact that the program wasn't functioning as an economic immigration program. It was well functioning as a family reunification. So families uh, would go to the province and say, you know what, uh, we'd like to bring this, this, this person. The province would say, okay, sure, you know, and they would come as PRs, but not because of their fit to a labor market need or whatnot. Despite that, their performance has not been very bad, but the program wasn't being responsive specifically, if you will, or primarily to labor market needs. Post-evaluation, and right now we are in the process of all provinces are participating, uh, 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 moving towards a standardization and making the program more and more economic driven, still established and led by provinces, but provinces working with the employers and determining those nomination processes. And when you nominate somebody, uh, making sure that that person uh, is a fit to a particular labor market need. So that's the direction that it's moving, uh, moving in. And also there have been some other um, uh, language um, uh, uh, requirements also built into the program uh, to ensure that uh, uh, newcomers are, uh, 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 they have that human capital uh, uh, as, they, as they arrive. Actually, that word human capital is a good segue to this. So now we'll also look at one of the major programs, the Federal Skill, um, uh, skill Worker Program. And there, sometimes you will see federal skill worker, sometimes you will see skill worker program. When somebody is talking federal, that means skill worker program, uh, Quebec left uh, outside of the program. Uh, so federal really uh, refers to the program that CIC, or federal government, manages as uh, skill worker program, as Quebec also uh, does uh, its own. So two things, uh, uh, and you will see it in these two slides, uh, to keep in mind both in terms of um, the history of immigration in Canada policies, and also where it is going, I guess. Um, I mentioned the human capital model. I mean, CIC, um, uh, for the last, say, 15 years or so, has been working with a model uh, that has been named as the human capital model, meaning that if we were to go out and basically identify what it takes to be a successful uh, Canadian permanent resident later on citizen, meaning education level, uh, uh, language, and whatnot. And then we brought people in, regardless of their background, regardless of their profession, occupation, and whatnot, those individuals, as they arrive to Canada, they will go around and find the right job. And if that job doesn't work, then they will transfer their skills to another job and that's the kind of a high level human capital really approach summary. In the last few years, if you have been watching, especially let's say ministerial instructions, different types of policy instruments when, as they started kicking in, what started happening is that uh, we started blending that model. In fact, not only blending it, first evidence-based work has informed and has brought greater integrity to that human capital model, which I will explain to you in a second what I mean. And then we also started blending that model with a more uh, occupation-specific uh, labor market responsiveness. And I will explain that in a second. But just in your mind, please keep that tension. Uh, and there is no, as far as I know, even the top economists in Canada, you will hear different kind of voices. Even the ones who are, you know, um, Arthur Sweetman, Garnet Picot, and top, top immigration, migration economists, uh, they always keep emphasizing human capital, very important. Don't let that go, because that's the one that gives the flexibility and whatnot, and, 
And yet at the same time, uh, uh, many others, uh, I mean, the same individuals also, uh, they acknowledge the, uh, uh, the need to be responsive to uh, market needs. So how did we increase the, um, uh, how did CIC, federal government, uh, increase the integrity of the program? Uh, if you are able to read again, I'm not sure. Uh, but the, one of the first one is the language abilities. First of all, uh, what you're looking at here, the new, new point system, it says, it's, this is the grid, but this is really the kind of a test that a federal skill worker applicant needs to pass to come in, right? The higher, uh, the way we structure this test, uh, if you score higher, your chances of uh, uh, becoming a successful immigrant will be, will be higher. So the first one is the language, and evidence and research has proven this again and again. Uh, English, French, official language ability uh, matters a lot. No matter what type of research you do, uh, you, you slice this this way, or you compare it the other way, you, you control for the uh, source of uh, uh, origin uh, of country, uh, again, uh, language. So what we did very recently is uh, uh, we started asking for a designated language test. So before, until two years ago, I think, people basically would come and say, uh, what is your language level, official language? And the people will basically self-report, will say high, low, medium. And sometimes, sometimes if there is time, because visa officers don't interview everybody, one out of 10 or 15, I believe, uh, in that conversation, maybe the visa officer might be testing that if that's true or not. But that was the really level of integrity in terms of uh, checking that criteria and giving a point against. Now, there's an independent third party certified language test source that this individual, the applicant, goes and gets tested and then submits a, a, a score that, um, if you will, supports their claim of whatever level that uh, they are saying. So that's one level of integrity uh, measure. The second element, again, uh, uh, determinants of uh, success, if you will, is the education. Uh, on the education level, very recent um, uh, uh, kind of, if you will, re uh, design revision uh, had been the, uh, this, uh, not to confuse with a firm education credential, Recognition, it's not that. That's a much more difficult problem to solve. We can discuss it uh, if you have questions on that. But it is the uh, establishing of the equivalency of the degree. So if I say and I come, I come from Boston University with a, uh, a you know, BA, or a BA in economics, and if I apply to come to Canada, before I would just basically say that's what I have, they would give me the point for a, a BA uh, level. Now, if I come with the same claim, CIC says, you know what? You need to go to a third party and get that uh, claim to be validated, if you will, and then come to us saying that your degree is equivalent to a degree in Canada. And out of that basically comes, if somebody says, I have a, I'm an engineer, assessment is done, oh, no, you're not really an engineer in the Canadian world. You might be a great you know, person with many skills, but you are a technician. If that's the result, that's what comes out. And that's another way uh, that the grid works. Then, of course, we um, uh, give points for the um, uh, work experience. And if you might notice, if you are able to read, is uh, the points in this work experience, uh, they have been lowered a little bit. Not that work experience doesn't matter, but this is one area uh, that is very difficult to uh, uh, substantiate. So the, the room was made in the grid uh, by lowering this, uh, but uh, by uh, increasing language and age. And on the age, more points were given. Again, this is also based on evidence and research to the best of our ability that we undertake, uh, that the younger the entry uh, to Canada uh, is uh, in terms of readiness for workforce participation, uh, uh, labor market participation, the higher the chances of, um, uh, of success. So, and obviously there is the arranged employment and adaptability, a few other points. And adaptability is important because it, it also gives you a point in terms of your spouse. Remember, we need to go, these are applicants who are being tested. So when a family comes, uh, the, the applicant, uh, mother or father, doesn't matter who the main applicant is, they make the application uh, and they are assessed. If they pass the test, the whole family arrives. But in the adaptability uh, factor, what we do also, we, uh, we offer points in terms of the um, uh, education of the spouse. Uh, and then that builds into this. So that kind of a one way of paying attention, if you will, to the uh, total human capital that the family is bringing uh, to Canada. So in this slide, what I'm presenting is the other, other side of the uh, coin. As I was saying to you, the human capital side. And this is what CIC for the last at least four years, I believe, uh, uh, has started doing 
especially using the ministerial instructions instrument to identify, again based uh, uh, on uh, uh, evidence and, and research, especially in this domain, actually we work with HRSDC very closely, ESDC. Uh, they have a COPS model. It's a long-term, up to 10 years uh, projection of labor market uh, uh, forecast, looking at occupations, where the gaps are and whatnot. So CIC relies on that. CIC relies on uh, prov provinces and territories, their uh, uh, input into the process, and uh, on the industry input. Basically, you're gonna say, well, what is all this going? All that information comes in, and CIC is trying, again, I'm saying trying, with all modesty here, is to anticipate in what uh, occupational uh, uh, levels, areas, uh, are there or will there be uh, shortfalls? And this is, this is not a, uh, how should I say, uh, hardcore science, really this is kind of more of an art, if you will. All statisticians and economists would, would admit this. And yet, uh, by doing this, uh, we believe we are increasing uh, uh, the, 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 the capacity of the immigration program to meet uh, 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 labor market needs. Uh, in addition to that previous slide where I um, uh, mentioned the, how the human capital uh, uh, works. Uh, and again, uh, uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this approach, uh, if you, you, you probably cannot, but there are engineers and a lot of the trades uh, uh, groups are, are, are listed in the current, uh, uh, current domain right now, um, in the current uh, program. So another very recent uh, program, you might have heard about this as well. This is the Federal Skilled Trades Program. This is very recent. Um, uh, it was introduced. And again, uh, in response to, uh, this is the second uh, phase of the uh, uh, coin, in response to uh, uh, reported or observed uh, uh, skill shortages. Uh, so in areas ranging from um, uh, uh, sheet metal workers, bale makers, uh, bale makers, iron workers, um, welders, uh, crane and heavy equipment operators, there's a whole uh, area of uh, uh, trades uh, uh, spectrum uh, around which uh, uh, for the last two, three years uh, we have been identifying uh, uh, shortfalls and uh, skill and uh, labor shortages. Now, another very quick footnote here, and I don't want to be misunderstood as if I'm offering immigration or we think that the immigration is a solution to all these big problems, because we know that immigration is only part of it, and when I say part of it, and the uh, Government of Canada has been saying this for, for a long time, there are uh, skill development programs uh, at the provincial and federal level. Uh, there are employers, uh, responsibilities in terms of investing in their own uh, employees uh, skills upgrades there are a number of other uh, there are universities and colleges uh, who also would be responding uh, to uh, labor uh, needs uh, forecasts so there are a number of actors who are and who should be uh, responding uh, to these challenges and immigration is only just one of them trying to uh, find its own niche, if you will, uh, in this, uh, uh, in this uh, uh, policy approach. So very last slide, uh, and we can come back to these if you like uh, later on, uh, no issues there. The very last slide, a few words on the kind of a future of the, not necessarily the future of all these programs. I think the programs as they are, uh, they are pretty much set in terms of their, their focus and we are constantly and on an ongoing basis measuring their, uh, their performance. Uh, you might have heard there is the, um, uh, the new uh, design of a system called Expression of Interest, EOI. Basically, this is not a new program. It's a, it's a uh, excuse me, might say, it's a kind of a matchmaking program, uh, initiative, where CIC, based on a, a model that was developed in Australia and New Zealand, uh, is going to create a pool, and into the pool, basically, uh, potential applicants or newcomers overseas or in Canada wanting to come to Canada as permanent residents, they will submit a uh, uh, expression of interest and provide a profile against the type of criteria or information that CIC, not criteria, but information that CIC requests. And these interests will be collected in that pool and this is an electronic environment. And then this pool, the idea is that in the pool, uh, CIC using its evidence base again, will rank these individuals in terms of their potential success, 
based on uh, factors that will be publicly, obviously, uh, announced. And then from that pool, at, in the first instance, in, you might say the pool, basically the, the whole system uh, at this moment, it might change, but the, the, the commitment to have it operational in January 2015. And from the pool, uh, at the beginning, CIC uh, will pick its federal skill, skilled workers. By pick, I mean the individuals that CIC will identify will be notified to put in their applications. The first submission is not an application, it's just an interest. And by that time, by the time CIC says you can apply, maybe they change their mind, that's a different issue. But uh, as, as CIC picks them, they will apply and then they will be processed. Not only CIC, of course, but the idea is uh, to also have employers to go into the pool and look at, again, the individuals, their profiles, and identify the individuals that will be uh, potentially best fit, if you will, for the type of uh, labor and skill shortage that they are experiencing. And then they will be able to tap the individual. And if that link is made, it is almost as good as an arranged employment. I didn't speak about that very much, but there is that little uh, stream business line, if you will, uh, that exists in, today in Canada. They're basically an employer. You don't need the EOI to do this. If an employer can demonstrate that they can find the uh, labor that they are looking for, they can initiate an arranged employment process. Uh, it's not the TFW process. It's an arranged employment process for an immigrant to come here as a PR and become a permanent resident. So this one is very similar to that, but where the several different employers will be able to look at the pool and, and see if there is a match uh, uh, between their needs and the, uh, uh, what the individuals are, are, are offering. Uh, and then from there on, again, uh, the same program. In a certain time period, I really don't know if I knew, I would share with you, uh, obviously the provinces will be able, if there is an agreement, if there is an interest, there are all kinds of conversations happening, will be able to go to the same pool and uh, pick individuals who might perhaps join their PMPs. So it's a basically a, a system that offers uh, uh, that, um, uh, uh, that facilitation, if you will. Nothing more than that, otherwise the policy principles uh, uh, remain, remain the same. Uh, in terms of the EOI, I guess you are going to hear more and more in the papers or other CIC website and different publications. It is something to watch and, 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 and kind of a follow, uh, I would strongly recommend. Uh, it is not a, although it's not a new program, it's a kind of a symbol of how, again, Government of Canada is trying to push the envelope towards economic immigration becoming a more effective um, policy tool, if you will, uh, to meet uh, Canada's uh, economic uh, growth needs. As you know, growth agenda, and that's where the uh, uh, CIC's, uh, if you will, uh, uh, efforts uh, have been, uh, have been uh, uh, put. Uh, at the end, just as a kind of concluding remarks, uh, what is the takeaway? Um, <laughs> there are probably many takeaways, or maybe none. Uh, but one thing to keep in mind, I guess, in a sense, the human capital and the occupation skill specific, that, that tension and that challenge, uh, uh, to keep an eye on that. Uh, uh, another one uh, to keep an eye is that the, the, how the TR and PR dynamic uh, plays with each other. This morning there was a question, if a good, a, a, a effective EOI system, if it works and if it, if it can respond to labor skill shortages of experienced by employers effectively, uh, can that also lower the pressure on temporary resident um, uh, demand? Uh, theoretically, it looks like, yes, it could, but only time uh, will tell, again, something else um, uh, to, uh, uh, to watch. Uh, and then the very last one, I guess, uh, take away again in terms of when you look at that, remember that slide that you couldn't read with those strategic outcomes and whatnot, CIC or the way, not only just CIC, uh, but I mean, Canada approaches migration is pretty complex. It is not only just finding the right workers for the right employer, get them working and whatnot. Uh, there is the integration, there is the settlement, there is the citizenship, there is the multiculturalism. This morning we talked about in terms of diversity and discrimination issues and uh, welcoming communities. So there are, there's a number of uh, factors that come together to create a, a, a suite of policies, if you will. Uh, I kind of you know, today only uh, because that's the hot topic, that's why I came to you today with the immigration uh, program agenda. Uh, otherwise, uh, not necessarily, that, that's not necessarily the most exciting one perhaps, but it is important. There are many other uh, aspects of uh, what CIC does. 
uh, especially in the domain of uh, settlement, uh, in the domain of uh, long-term integration, second generations. Uh, the PISA study came out three, three days ago. I don't know if you noticed the OECD 15-year-old um, uh, uh, science uh, reading math uh, uh, skills. Um, uh, second generation stories are very important. I mean, Canadians, immigrants are not are doing really well at the same level as the uh, uh, as Canadian born. Uh, so, so there are a lot of other uh, uh, other areas uh, uh, to pay attention to, but this is the one that I kind of uh, shared with you today. So I'll stop at this kind of very moment almost, and uh, hopefully you have some questions. Uh, if I made so much sense <laughs> that you have no questions, I, I, I would worry about it. Uh,